Starting the uh, workshop uh, of the Social Brain Research Group, 2014 first semester. Each year, our group organizes at least two workshops, um, and our main goal is, is to achieve uh, a broad understanding on issues on semantics and on cognitive sciences. And this year, we invited Maria Frappoli, who is a researcher and professor at the University of Granada, uh, to speak about her latest book, The Nature of Truth. And we will have to comment her presentations um, John Bollender, Tudor Baetu, Vasilis Tompandis, and Adriano Brito, and myself. Um, and also we have here the participation of members of the Social Brains Group uh, uh, who will discuss and um, debate the main issues presented by Maria Frappoli. So, um, Maria, Maria is a long-term researcher at the University of Granada and was former president of the Logic and Philosophy of Science Association uh, in Spain and, uh, and has been working and contributing for many years now for the philo analytic philosophy in Europe, and has now some catedratic and uh, research uh, posts or some in Spain and Europe. Has been working also with Susan Hack and other analytical philosophy around the world. Okay, maybe I think we can start. I am very happy to have you here, you. and again, we are here in 2008, presenting your views on truth already, and so we have the work. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. So, uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I have to say that uh, I'm sincere if I say that I don't, I think that I don't deserve so much attention, so <laughs> I feel deeply honored. Thank you very much to Sofia and to, to all of you for being here. And um, as uh, Sofia has said, uh, I was here in, in 2008 to present my views on truth, and I was uh, naive enough to think that if I wrote a book on the topic, I would get rid of it. <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> this hasn't uh, occurred, so I'm here again to speak about the notion of truth, the nature of truth. And uh, I want to say that uh, the, um, I mean, I don't know, I don't know the nature of, what is the nature of truth. I don't know what is the nature of anything. The title of my book is Because. Uh, so it's a, it's a reference to, to one of uh, Ramsey's paper, papers on truth, uh, a paper who was, uh, wasn't published, uh, wasn't published during Ramsey's uh, lifetime, and uh, it, uh, in these papers, it was the, the first time, as I know, uh, that in the 20th century, uh, somebody uh, used the term pro-sentence to explain the functioning of two terms. And this is why I, I have uh, sort of borrowed uh, Ramsey's title. But, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm not going to, to talk about the nature of uh, anything. In fact, uh, 
uh, this is not, uh, I, I'm going to comment some slides from this presentation, but this, this is not the docu uh, document I have prepared for today. I have another one, but I think that the most important thing in this, uh, uh, at this moment is that I try to explain you which are the philosophical motivations behind my proposal. The proposal is a, is a technical proposal, and I will, and of course, of course, I will argue for it, for it, and I will be happy to explain as much detail as uh, you are interested in. But I think that the most important, the important thing is understanding why I thought that uh, this topic uh, should be pursued. And the reason is that some years ago, I, I edited with uh, a colleague of mine, uh, a professor at the University of Granada, a volume, and now we have uh, edited another one, uh, putting together uh, classical papers on truth, on the notion of truth in the 20th century. So the, the volume is called, uh, well, the, the two, uh, there are two, two volumes. The first one is called uh, uh, Teorías de la Verdad en el Siglo XX, Theories of Truth in the 20th Century. And the second one is called uh, Teorías uh, Contemporaneas de la Verdad, Contemporary Theories of Truth. And uh, working on, on the topic, I realized that if uh, there were so many interesting and different and even incompatible proposals on the notion of truth, something should go very wrong. There would be something very wrong in the, in the, in the core of the topic that uh, allow that allows uh, so many different theories which are incompatible to each other. So the idea I I drew from uh, after that uh, uh, work of edition was that the situation with the notion of truth was similar to the one depicted in the in the famous Indian story in the uh, famous. Uh, 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 well, in this uh, Indian story, which is the black men and the elephants. So there were several men, uh, blind uh, wise men who tried to understand, or tried to, well, yes, to understand and to express uh, what an elephant was, and some of them touched here, and they thought that an, an elephant is like a wall, and some other touched here, and then they thought that it was a a, a, tar, a spear, and some of them were, uh, thought that, that an elephant was like a snake, or like like a tree, or like a fan, or like a rope, etc. And uh, in some sense, the the, the the moral of this story is that all of them were right and all of them were wrong. And this is exactly the feeling I had when I began to work in the series of truth in the 20th century. So what I, I want to say is that all these series of truth, there are many others, but I have just listed some of them, the parties and wines rotational approach, or quine's characterization of truth as a mechanism for semantic absence, or Horich's explanation of truth as a neuroanalyzer, or Strosson's characterization of truth as a marker of illocutionary force. Ah, wait, wait, from here to... <laughs> Sorry. Okay, all of them and many others. The point is, each one takes some aspect of the fun of the functioning of the truth concept right. How is it possible then that at the end of the day we don't have a comprehensive theory of how the notion of truth works in natural language? Uh, then, what I think is that 
Uh, I don't believe in the eternal, eternal problems of philosophy. If a problem is eternal, there is something wrong with it. So my proposal is to stop and try to look at the problem of truth from a different perspective. But my perspective is nothing, neither radical nor either radical nor uh, original, because what I'm proposing is looking at the notion of truth, at the function of, of the concept, from the contemporary sciences of language, from contemporary linguistics and the philosophy of language. So nothing very uh, strange. So I want to so I, I, I want to defend Aristotle's view. This means what I'm going to propose you here is or I take it to be a development of the Tarsian dictum to say of what it is that it is, or of what is not that it is not, is true. Who could reject such a victim, <laughs> which is just an analytic truism. And I endorse the insight by Ramsey, the following insight. What is the meaning of true, of the word true? It seems to me that this is Ramsey's words. It seems to me that the answer is really perfectly obvious, that anyone can see what it is, and that the difficulty only arises, and that difficulties only arise when we try to say what it is. So the problem is uh, with truth, or with the term truth, is not understanding the functioning. All of us master the notion. The problem is explaining uh, this practice that we all master. So, seeing that the uh, diversity of proposal is no, no wonder that people have defended that truth is a contradictory notion, or that the notion of truth cannot be defined, or that truth is primitive, or blah, blah, blah. Yes, no, no wonder. But uh, I don't think so. I think that Truth is a very, uh, so it's a complex notion, but that can be perfectly uh, accounted for using the resources of contemporary philosophy of language, and this is what I'm, go I'm going to try to explain to you in these days. Then go to the... Yeah, this is the the document uh, I have prepared for today. <laughs> you can interrupt me anytime, make comments or whatever, because as I have said, I'm much more interested in, that, in, in communicating uh, the, 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 the general feature of my, of my proposal than going into the detail which are more technical and, and that you can see which is the plan of my uh, talk for today. Well, uh, the last point is my proposal. My proposal is, in, so my approach to truth belongs to the presententialist kind. So my proposal is presententialism or some variety of presentationalism. Uh, but, so presentationalism is Ramsey's proposal, but also I think it is uh, Strosson's proposal. I would like to think that it, is, it was a sort of proposal. If the proposal by Dorothy Grover, Christopher Williams, and uh, uh, Robert Brandon, contemporary. But what I have done is uh, placing the presentationalist core, which is a semantic thesis, into contemporary pragmatism. So I will do 
Sorry. <laughs> I, yeah, sorry, sorry. Okay. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah. Uh, uh, the idea is now I'm, uh, so I have converted into pragmatism, so I think that uh, this is the correct way of looking at a theory of meaning in general. I think that uh, pragma a, pra a pragmatic or pragmatic <coughs> perspective is the correct perspective, perspective to overcome this uh, inorganic variety of proposals, which cannot be pulled of them together with a contradiction. So this is what I'm going to, to propose today. But this is the last point. The first points are probably are much more general and probably much more in, interesting in some sense. So the first thing I want to, def uh, to defend is that Pache Frege truth is not one of a kind. So there is nothing uh, special in the notion of truth. So we have thousands of uh, notions in natural languages which work in some sense like truth works. So nothing special with the notion. But it doesn't mean that the notion is trivial or redundant or simple or whatever. The notion of truth, truth is a higher order notion. It's a higher order concept. And it's a quite complex notion that and uh, is put to work, so to say, in many different uh, philosophical and scientific realms. For instance, we talk about truth, or we use, uh, typically we use the notion of truth when we talk about epistemology, or when we talk about philosophy of science, when we talk, uh, talk about uh, metaphysics, in sciences in general, in philosophy in general. So there are many, uh, many different realms in which uh, truth is put to work, uh, but it doesn't mean that the notion is, uh, or the, that, that the meaning of the notion is uh, ambiguous, or that it has many different notions, or also. So, uh, one of my thesis, one of the thesis I want to defend today, is that the meaning of truth can be completely exhaustively explained using the theoretical resources that contemporary philosophy of logic, uh, sorry, philosophy of, of language, uh, put at our disposal. So we can understand the notion of truth without any doubt, just by looking, just by using um, the theories and insights of contemporary philosophy of language. Another thesis that I want to defend is that understanding the meaning of truth, really understanding the meaning of truth, doesn't force us to renounce our ordinary discourse on truth. So we can continue using the notion in the way in which we do in our ordinary uh, communic uh, communicative exchanges. So we don't need to do anything uh, about our way of uh, talking. And a further thesis that I want to communicate is that a theory of truth, as any other theory, has precise limits. So not everybody, no, sorry, not everything can be uh, accounted for by a theory of truth. There are things that just lie outside the theory of truth. A theory of truth is a technical theory about the meaning of a notion in the same sense in which a theory of quantifiers is a technical proposal about the working of some kind of terms, nothing else. And then my proposal, which is prosententialism. Uh, This is the way in which I begin my book. And the, the question is, what is uh, the, myst the mystery behind a toy conversation of this kind? 
Victoria, which is my daughter, says, I don't like Mondays. And Juan, which is my son, says, what Victoria says is true, which is the mystery behind the normal uh, communicative exchange. And my answer is none whatsoever. There is no mystery in the way in which we are using the terms here. We all understand what is going on in a, in a conversation of this kind. The point is that there is no intractable feature in the functioning of truth. Uh, truth is a concept that appears or can, or can be expressed in natural languages by means of many different terms, but there is no, no uh, mysterious feature from a semantic point of view in the meaning of these terms in natural languages, but this doesn't mean that the notion is simple or its functioning is obvious. On the contrary, it requires a highly sophisticated conceptual apparatus, but fortunately, we have it at our disposal. It's not, it's not, so what I'm trying to, to, to show is that my proposal is not ad hoc, so I'm not inventing a proposal to explain, to explain the meaning of truth but I'm trying to uh, take profit of, uh, of, the, of the theoretical apparatus uh, of uh, meaning that we have in, natural, in philosophy of language. So one of my purposes is to dispel the air of mystery that has traditionally accompanied the notion. Uh, so, uh, to show that uh, there is nothing uh, really mysterious behind the notion, but at the same time explaining that there are several different theoretical levels involved in the apparently uh, simple question, what is truth? What is truth can be answered in different ways because, in fact, it codifies different uh, questions. This is uh, the, the text by Ramsey that I have uh, read uh, before. Uh, uh, this part uh, I have uh, read before, but not the, the second part, which is, so this is uh, Ramsey's uh, word. For we must distinguish one question, what is true? From the, quite, from the quite different question, what is true? We do not hope to learn an infallible means of distinguishing truth from falsehood, but simply to know what it is that this word true means. This was Ramsey's uh, aim. It is a word, Ramsey says, it is a word which we all understand but if we try to explain it, we can easily get involved at the history of philosophy shows in a maze of confusion. So, my purpose is to pursue Ramsey's project with some, uh, with some, I think, some essential differences. The first difference is that I'm not interested in the meaning of the word true. I'm interested in the meaning of the concept of truth. Because, as I, uh, tell my I, I told my students again and again, we philosophers of language don't work on languages. <laughs> it's a paradox, but it's true. We are not linguists. We philosophers of language work work with concepts. So I'm interested not in the functioning of the term in a particular natural language, but on the fu functioning of the concept in every um, natural language, I hope. And I'm interested in the, in, and because I'm interested in the, in the functioning of the concept, I don't think that there is any essential difference in the way in which we talk about truth. 
when we talk about truth, we can say the truth or so the truth, which is a substantive, a name, or is true, which is an, an adjective, or truly, which is an adverb, or it is true, which is uh, allegedly an operator, or whatever. So I think that the differences in expression, in, <clears throat> in these expressions, are irrelevant. That the notion of truth, the concept, performs the same function under any uh, different, uh, under any linguistic uh, uh, guise in which it appears. Well, I don't, of course, I don't uh, agree with Tarski when he said that the notion of truth was inconsistent or alternatively that natural languages are inconsistent because they include a notion like the notion of truth. I don't agree with, with Tarski, among other things, because, because I don't understand what it might uh, mean that a language is inconsistent. And because now I'm a pragmatist, I cannot give any sense to the idea that a notion that, as far as I know, all human beings, or yeah, all, all human beings with, with a with a developed, mature language, possess can be inconsistent. From a pragmatist point of view, this uh, fact wouldn't make any sense. Of course, I don't think, I don't, I don't agree with Davison, who uh, uh, declared that trying to define truth is a folly, or with Michael Lynch, who has said recently, it would be nice to find out the whole truth and nothing but the truth about truth. Nice, but practically impossible. I don't think so. <laughs> but I put this uh, a quotation here. I have included this quotation here because this is something that almost everybody assumes. So it, uh, it's, some, it's, it's uh, something that I can't understand of the, of the contemporary philosophy, in general philosophy of language in particular, that almost everybody accepts that the notion of truth is intractable, or is undefinable, or something like that, and there is no justification for such a for such a claim. What I want to to defend is that uh, truth is a complex and multifunctional notion, and uh, the various uh, jobs that the notion performs are performed by means of the different kind of expressions in which the, um, uh, by means of which the, the notion appears in languages. As I have said, the notion of truth is some, has sometimes, or adopts uh, sometimes the appearance of a uh, adjective, it's true, or uh, adverb, or an operator, or truth, etc. And I, as, I accept that there are different theoretical projects which are related to the notion of truth. For instance, uh, there is, as we have, see, uh, we have seen in the, in the text by Ramsey, one can uh, inquire about the criteria by means of which we declare that some propositions are true and some other are false. This is a, a, a kind of project which is related, related to truth. But what I want to de uh, defend here is that this is not the only possible project. And the project that I'm going to pursue is the, the project of trying to give the meaning of truth. I don't think that giving the meaning of the notion will solve all problems related to it. I don't think so. So I think that maybe there are uh, genuine epistemic or epistemological problems related to the notion of truth, that they are probably, I don't know, I think I don't understand them, but maybe they are metaphysical problems related to the notion of truth and so on. But what, uh, what I do think is that without understanding the way in which the notion works 
in our system of concepts, we cannot understand how the notion works in some other uh, realms. So, uh, Susan Hart has said, not just in this uh, paper, but several times, that there are multiple truths, but that truth is unique. This is a, let's say, a paradoxical truism. <laughs> I want to, something that uh, I want to, to do is trying to explain in terms of contemporary philosophy of language, this truism. And the way of saying it, in, uh, the, let's say, a more, uh, probably, a, a more sophisticated way of saying it, of uh, expressing the same intuition, is that the content, so I try this uh, paragraph to be an explanation of this intuition, the content of a particular act of, of ascribing truth to a content, so the content of a particular act of ascribing truth to a proposition, can be any element of a wide variety uh, of contextually salient propositions, even though truth is not ambiguous in natural language. What I mean is that, so Susan has said, uh, truth is unique. What does it mean? It means that she thinks, and I think too, that there is no mathematical truth versus physical truth, metaphysical truth versus empirical truth, necessary truth versus formal truth. No. Truth, the notion, is the same in every context. But it doesn't mean that we cannot apply the notion so that we cannot ascribe the notion to propositions of any kind. In fact, we can say that a formal proposition is true. We can, we can say that an empirical proposition is true. We can say that a mathematical proposition is true, or blah, blah, blah. Metaphysical proposition, religious proposition, aesthetic proposition is true, and so on. So, this is the the whole, let's say, the whole mystery behind the idea that truth is one and multiple. Well, yes. Yeah. It's one because the, the concept is the same, and it's multiple because you, ca you can apply, apply the concept to different uh, kinds of propositions. Nothing particularly interesting here. So, now, go for the more technical details. I can stop here, if you like, and we can talk about these general issues, or go? No, no. Okay. So, but if you have any um, any comment or any kind. Um, I don't mind to be interrupted. Not at all. So, you can ask. Well, okay. So, uh, I have said that I, I, I have converted into a pragmatist, and it's true. But uh, my pragmatist is Frege and pragmatism. So people uh, can think that Frege, Frege wasn't a pragmatist, but uh, I assure you that he was. And the proof of it, of it is uh, what uh, we all call now the principle of context. Uh, in the introduction uh, to this uh, uh, masterpiece, The Foundation of Arithmetics, Frege said that only in the context of a sentence, well, he said, he said, that in German, which means both sentence and proposition, so we, we cannot be sure exactly what he meant, but he said that only in the context of, of a sentence, which is the standard translation, only in the context of a sentence has a word meaning. And I completely agree. And in fact, what he did in this book, in the Foundation of Arithmetics, is put into work this intuition in order to offer a 
definition of natural number, the notion of natural number. He didn't say, but uh, it perspires from the book, that his diagnosis about the problems that the definition of natural, num uh, sorry, natural uh, number has had uh, for theorists was that they cut the language in pieces too short, just the number. And what he, uh, and what he proposed was, OK, look at the whole sentence. Look at the equations, which are the fundamental sentences in which natural ne uh, numbers appear. So I take uh, this book to be a development of this principle of context, this idea of the principle of context. Again, before Frege, we didn't have a definition of natural number. Frege, uh, Frege's proposal was that the reason was that we should look not at the term, but at the whole sentence in order to understand what is the contribution of the term at the proposition, to the proposition exp uh, expressed by the sentence. So I propose to do the same with the notion of truth. So I'm a pragmatist and I'm a Fregean. So one of my one of the of my hypotheses is like Frege's that we don't know what is the meaning of truth because we have had a too narrow focus. We have focus just on terms and not on what speakers, what rational agents do when they use the whole sentence, okay? So, like I said, that natural num uh, numbers appear typically in equations. I'm saying that truth terms appear uh, typically in what is now called truth ascription. What is a truth ascription? A truth ascription is a sentence, like this one, in which <coughs> is applied, ascribed to the content of, of a subject, of an expression, which is fully propositional. So a truth, sorry. No, if you need to write there is I will. Okay. So the idea is, what do we do when we use the term truth? in any of its, of its guises. Well, what we do is attributing or ascribing truth to what? To a proposition, to a fully propositional content. Then, the standard way in which we, or the standard sentence in which we use to turn have this form. A subject, what she says, whose content is a proposition, and then a predicate, a dummy predicate, which is in which appears the notion of truth. We call this a truth ascription. And uh, as happens with many terms in the philosophy of language, the, the expression truth ascription is uh, so can have different meanings. It can refer to the to the whole act, the speech act in which in which an agent ascribes truth to a content, but also to the sentence itself. So my proposal is in a primary sense, a truth ascription is an act. And being a pragmatist means that practices are our facts, the facts that we have to explain and the beginning of the of the inquiry. So we have to look at, at the act, at the act that, that an agent perform performs by the use of a truth ascription. 
But then, once we have, under, we have understood the, whole, the general import, the whole import of this act, we can continue an inquiry about the meaning of the sentences we have used in this kind of act. And then, if we, if we are still alive, uh, we can go and try to understand the meaning of substantial expressions. But understanding the meaning of sub, uh, substantial expressions is something that we cannot do unless we understand first the kind of act in which we are involved. This is a pragmatist methodology, and this is what I'm going to do uh, here. Uh, okay, so uh, 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 Sophia suggested that uh, maybe I might uh, use the black ball. This is a white ball. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but uh, and but uh, she's right because the idea is quite simple, and I, I will I will give you uh, I will give you examples in some other slides. But uh, at this time we can say something like: Imagine Sophia says. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. I thought this thing. <laughs> yeah, because we are very original. <laughs> Probably it's, a, it's an example that I, uh, have been never used in the no, <laughs> It's raining. So Sophia says, it's raining. So, what is a, a true subscription? A true subscription is the act in which I ascribe truth, and then I say, is true of what? Of what kind of, of, of sorry? Very faint, very faint, we cannot read it. I, I mean, I don't know. Better? Yes. Yes. So, Sophia? Sophia? <laughs> Beautiful, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> smiling. <laughs> Sophia says it's raining. So what is a true subscription? A true subscription is just an act in which typically a teacher uses a sentence of the following kind. A sentence in which the predicate is true is said of the content of a singular term. But the singular term that, that you put here, it has, be, uh, has to be a singular term for this sentence to be well formed. The singular term that you put here has to have a fully propositional content. So you can say, it is true, but this is a, a true subscription only if this it refers to a whole proposition, or you can say what Sophia says is true, but, okay? So, but the idea is that you can't predicate true, true, you can't predicate true of objects but just of propositional content. And when we want to be very technical in the philosophy of language, we say that truth is a higher order concept. That's, this is what being a higher order concept means. Sometimes people, uh, or theorists of truth, have uh, asked about the bearers of truth. And people think, and people say, okay, okay, sentences can be bearers of truth, or propositions can be bearers of truth, and so on. Well, what I, I have said shows that the primary bearers, if this kind of inquiry had any sense, but I doubt it, 
the primary bearers of truth are propositions because they are the, let's say, entities to which we ascribe the notion when we, when we use truth ascriptions. It is common, it is uh, standard to say that truth is a semantic notion, the semantic notion par excellence. I don't understand what this means, I have to say. Uh, truth is as, uh, a semantic notion as it is a syntactic uh, expression and a pragmatic act. All our notions have a semantic side, of course, because all our notions uh, are meaningful or try to be meaningful. So uh, I'm not rejecting that truth is a semantic notion. What I'm saying is it's a semantic notion and a syntactic and a pragmatic. It, it has the whole pack. But I, want, I would like to differentiate this, the, uh, three kinds of thesis related to these three levels of inquiry, the syntactic level, the semantic level, and the pragmatic level. I know that this uh, distinction in these three levels has proved to be very useful, very fruitful in the last century, but I think that uh, it is time now to give it a uh, deserved rest <laughs> and put it aside. I think that sometimes this kind of distinctions uh, are, well, when they, when they give everything that they have, uh, sometimes they put, they, they are uh, more, uh, more a hindrance than a, a name. Uh, because people uh, tend to think that this distinction, syntactic, semantic, and pragmatics, in fact, re represent, represent ontological levels of reality, and that there is something out there which is syn syntax, and uh, other thing, or other realm of reality which is semantics, and other realm which is pragmatics. And this is wrong, just wrong. But in any case, uh, as I have uh, said already, I think that if we want to, to preserve the distinction, we should begin with the pragmatic level, so looking at the, uh, at the actions that uh, the agent, agents perform. But in any case, uh, I can't say something about truth in each one of these levels. And this is what... Uh, what I'm going to do now. So what I mean is that uh, I don't think that the distinction is very interesting. I think that uh, we shouldn't uh, assume that this distinction represents uh, levels of reality of any kind, but if we want to use it as a methodological aid, it's okay. The core I will answer this question. For instance, I mean, we can use this aid. For instance, I don't. Well, you you have Recanati. You you have told me so. You know that uh, a, a hot issue in contemporary philosophy of language is that the the uh, divide between semantics and pragmatics which is semantics and which is pragmatics. And I said, what is the interest of this kind of divide? Semantics is exactly, exactly what we want it to be, <laughs> nothing else. And the same with pragmatics. You know what I mean? So, that the, so th there is nothing out there that is really the semantic realm. And there is another thing which is really the pragmatic realm. Semantics and pragmatics are ways of looking at, at, at one reality which is one and the same. This is the point I'm 
trying to stress here. I'm not saying that, I mean, I'm not saying that it's not interesting at all. What I'm saying is that if you go too deep in this kind of uh, debate, you run the risk of being scholastic and, and just develop a thousand of little terms to distinguish probably small, irrelevant things. I don't know if you want to. I don't want to. Okay. <laughs> no, no. What, what, but, but, I, I just if your approach was to say the semantics as pragmatics of truth, or if it was just throw it aside and look at truth in a more holistic way? Both. So I think, uh, well, this is a, uh, it's a pragmatist uh, intuition, too. Uh, I learned it from Susan Hart, but uh, she attributes it to Peirce, which is the idea of that reality is uh, continuous. And this is what pra uh, American pragmatists uh, call <laughs> synergism. It's a, it's a very ugly term, and this is probably why <laughs> nobody knows it. Synergism. And the idea is reality, re reality, whatever this means, doesn't come into parts, into portions. So we are, we, we are in, I was about to say we, we face, but we don't face. We belong to our reality, which is continuous. So I don't think that there is nothing essential in this distinction between semantic, pragmatic, and syntax. What I mean is that if you want to follow this distinction, we can say things in the three levels. But if these levels, um, if these level, levels uh, don't help us in understanding the, the, the functioning of the notion, I don't have any problem in throwing them away. This is the point. So, I have, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just, uh, I'm trying to understand a bit better uh, this notion of true descriptions as complex propositional variables. So so when you're saying that these are a complex propositional variables, as I understand it, the, the variable part is the placeholder for a proposition, right? <clears throat> and then the, the true predicate behaves like a logical concept, constant or something? Both, but, but Both? Not, no. you, can, you can choose. <laughs> Let me uh, five minutes and I will explain. It's uh, so uh, um, okay. Let me do it. let me explain. This is the the semantic code of the proposal. This is the semantic code of, of the proposal. Uh, I'm a presentationalist because I think that uh, truth ascriptions work as propositional variables, and I have said complex propositional variables because. Uh, the term, and now I'm focusing on the subsentential expression, the truth terms are means for building complex propositional variables. But, for instance, Dorothy Grover said that the pro sentence was the singular term that acted as uh, as um, subject right. in truth ascriptions. But for instance, uh, Christopher Williams understood that the pro sentence is the whole sentence. What have, ha, have I done? Well, I have accepted both, and I distinguish in my book. I mean, this just, what I mean is that this, the, the, there is nothing here but a piece of terminology. What I have said in my book is that, so I will, I will distinguish between uh, uh, um, sentential pro-sentences and uh, nominal pro-sentences. The, the, the idea of a pro-sentence is that it is an expression in language that can refer or inherit 
a propositional content. But this function can be performed by expressions with the category of singular terms and by expressions with the category of complete sentences. And why? Well, this is a, a pragmatist explanation. My point has been here that, so I'm using, I, I'm having in my mind the, the metaphor of the toolbox, the Wittgensteinian uh, metaphor. And the idea is, it depends on what you are doing. If you want to refer to a, propo to a proposition or, a, or to a propositional content, you have to use the appropriate tool. And in natural languages, we use singular term to refer. But sometimes you might want, you might be uh, interested in assuming or endorsing a propositional content. Assuming or, en or endorsing is not something that you can do with singular terms, which are appropriate tools for referring. So we use the whole sentence. Then, what is a, a pro-sentence? A pro-sentence is a variable. A variable whose content is a proposition. But pro-sentences can be of, of different kinds. We can have nominal pro-sentences and sentential pro-sentences. This is my point. This is clear now. So uh, the idea, the, the core of pro-sententialism is a semantic, let's say, semantic thesis. And the semantic thesis is that pro-sentences work as variables. Do we have simple variables in natural languages to perform this function? The answer is yes, we have. For instance, we have two adverbs in all natural languages I know of. We have two adverbs that are simple sentences, which are yes and no. Are you coming today? Yes. Uh, are you enjoying the talk? No. They are simple pro sentences, <coughs> but because they are they have the grammatical category of adverbs, we can't use them in all situations. For instance, they can't be the antecedents of conditionals. So to use these propositional variables as antecedent of a conditional, for instance, or as a way of making a, a special kind of assertion, we will need propositional variables of the sentential kind, just to maintain well-formedness. Hmm? Uh, so I hope that by now this idea would be clear. If uh, somebody says out of a context, what Victoria told you was true, what is he saying? And the answer is nothing at all. Uh, Asking what is somebody saying by the use of a true subscription of this kind is like asking if she is blonde or if he is tall. Well, I have no idea. So if you don't put this expression to work in an appropriate context, and I can see or can discover who is the content to which you are referring to, I can't ask this kind of questions. So the idea is the one put uh, forward by Austin, and it's the following truism. It takes two to make a truth. <laughs> yes. A truth ascription is a second order act Truth ascriptions as sentences are 
perfectly meaningful sentences. So there is nothing wrong in this kind of sentence, as a sentence. But a variable, it doesn't have a content unless you offer the context from which it can inherit it. But the context, uh, so uh, in this sense, I will explain this better probably in some of the talks tomorrow or this afternoon or whatever. Uh, but uh, the idea is you can, uh, you can point to the content of a pronoun, for instance. If I say, if uh, somebody says, uh, he's late, and I, and I ask, who is he? And Sophia said, he. Okay, you can point uh, to a person to which this pronoun refers, but you can't point to a proposition. So the only way in which you can recover a proposition in a second order act in which you are using a true transcription is because there is a first order assertive act in which a proposition has been put forward. This is why uh, I have said that uh, uh, acts of true transcription are second order acts. And this is the whole mystery behind the liar paradox. There is nothing interesting in the, li in the liar paradox, as I will try to show you tomorrow or on Friday, I don't know why. Okay, so, this is... Yeah, you started late. No, I, I, I'm going to stop already, okay? But, but just one thing. So, the, these uh, examples. If Victoria told you that Brazilian tradition in logic and philosophy is admired all, all over the world, and I said what Victoria told you was true, what is the content I'm endorsing? The content I, I'm endorsing is this content. But if, if Victoria had said 2 plus 2 equals 4, equals 4, and I said, okay, what Victoria told you was true, what I was saying myself was that 2 plus 2 equals 4, and so on. No mystery here. But the truth notion means the same. There is no fluctuation in the, in the meaning of the notion. The notion is a means of building up a true subscription and a true subscription is a propositional variable by means of which we can endorse any propositional content whatsoever. But the propositional content endorsed can be of any kind, formal, metaphysical, empirical, aesthetic, religious, or mystical, whatever you want. There is uh, no restriction here. Okay? So we can stop here and then continue. Yes. Just wanted to to make some comments oh, <laughs> about the talk and maybe some questions. So, but now I don't need to be here. Before we have our coffee break, but uh, so I I have a very very simple. Um, uh, can I? Um, Is it open in your pen drive? No, it's an open. Uh, this is not a pen drive. It's just a device to. Uh, okay. To use it. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. This you are w working in here. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And you can stay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I have some. To put this somewhere, just to help me, so that. É aqui, né? Só abrir o conecto. Não, 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 não vou voltar. Não, não, é o meu que está aqui. É o meu pendrive. E, e o workshop está dentro dele. É, 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 é só para mim. É. 
Não abriu? Não leu. Bom. Porque tá em que note? Que note não lê, né? Não, não é que note. Não. É que note. Não tem. Ok. Uh, ok. Ai, eu vou... Só um minutinho. Posso mudar rapidinho aqui? Uhum. Por aqui. Vou mudar isso aqui. Obrigada por trazer Maria, can I use this device? Uh, where is your the right, it's on? Oh no, it's here. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, I have some very <coughs> few uh, comments about what Maria already said. Uh, more questions and doubts than uh, assertions, but uh, I think my comments can clarify uh, some of uh, Maria's intentions and um, uh, claims about truth. So I will put, and I hope you can reply so that the the can clarify or a little bit more your proposal, okay? So um, you have you Maria, have a have, have um, a, a background that we can call a logicist background. So. Your when you start your book, you say we must understand quantifiers, we must understand variables, we must understand structure, logical structure, so as to understand truth. And uh, not everybody would say that. <laughs> but at the same time, you say uh, we need to be pragmatists. We need to. To, to understand the tradition of American pragmatism and also of English uh, prag pragmatics, uh, so Austin, Searles, uh, English and American pragmatics. So that uh, logic isn't enough to understand truth. So, it isn't just a structure, it is also something that we must understand from a speech act theory. So when you start uh, to read your proposal, it's not very clear how you will do that. So, um, may I ask you this question? Yes, yeah. it's important. Stay here. Stay here. My God. No, the idea is that uh, well, now I'm going to say something quite, something really radical. Logic is nothing. <laughs> to put it mildly. <laughs> uh, uh, what I mean is that uh, I have I have said at the beginning of my talk that I I wrote this book on truth on truth to get rid of the notion, <laughs> and it's true because I want to work on quantifiers at the end. But again, I, I, I don't, I, I don't know why, but 
I cannot do it because it, all the time everybody is asking me about truth, which is um, okay, which is I take it to be a quite uh, trivial topic. What I mean is that my position in logic is exactly the same as my position about truth. I think that we can't understand logic, we can't understand prayer, we can't understand quantifiers, we can't understand conditional unless we understand what agents do when they use them. So my kind, my type of philosophy of logic, the type of philosophy of logic I'm engaged in is as a part of a general philosophy of language. So I think that uh, we have done things very uh, badly in the 20th century and, this, and that the, this formalist tradition in logic has had very bad effect in our understanding of our inferential uh, So, I'm not thinking of structures. I'm not thinking of logic in this sense. I, 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 I use uh, logic as an illustration, but the idea is at the beginning of the 20th century, for instance, when John Ford was uh, building cars for the first time, probably uh, people tried to explain how cars worked uh, to their children, saying that uh, the, the motor uh, of a car was like the heart. Now we do things uh, in, the, in, the other, so in the other way. We say, okay, when we uh, want to explain to, the, to children how a heart works, we say it is like the motor of a car. Why? Because we are much more familiar <laughs> with cars than with, I don't know, anatomy or something like that. And this is the, the, the trick. So I think that we, all of us, the people who are, uh, who are interested in, log in, sorry, in truth, are quite familiar with formal languages, formal languages that we have considered to be logic. I don't know why with formal languages. And this is why I uh, try to uh, take profit of this familiarity and talk about mm. uh, logic. But I don't, I mean, I, I'm not a formalist uh, at all. So I, I'm also a pragmatist about logic. Okay. So, um, so, so, you, you destroyed my comment. <laughs> <laughs> I would comment anywhere, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but okay. Um, so I don't think you 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 happen. mention <laughs> you mention quine uh, sometimes in your book, but so to criticize him. Oh, criticize. <laughs> okay, but anyway, uh, but quine um, was a kind of pragmatist, yeah. not a very um, bold one, not a very um, radical pragmatist. He was very, um, how do you say, uh, uh, restricted in his pragmatism, I think, because it was a behavioristic pragmatism. But at the same time, uh, his proposal of understanding uh, syntactic and semantic structures um, had a pragmatist background, uh, not very strong background, but it was a kind of background. Uh, so he tried to unify, unify logical analysis with some pragmatist uh, analysis. Very simple, no? about assertions that could be true or false utterances that could be true or false. At the same time, true or false was something that wasn't the main uh, goal uh, for a client to understand, in the sense that not the notion, not the, the term, not the concepts. It was implicit in his theory that uh, we use true and false uh, utterances to uh, uh, to inform, to, to, to communicate some content. 
And that was a presupposition for, for quine semantics or for quine skeptical semantics, as some <coughs> people, uh, want to call it. Um, so I, I, I think um, your proposal isn't so far from Quine's in the sense that you, I wanted to say that, <laughs> sorry, that you are in some sense still a logicist and, uh, uh, and in some sense also uh, not a strong pragmatist. That was my interpretation. Maybe I'm I'm totally wrong. No, but I know. Uh, no, what I mean is that uh, uh, I think that uh, well, something also very radical, and I'm not going to be to to put my face in front of the, of the camera this time. I think that uh, Quine's influence has been very damaging for me, for me but I think that it is not just in the twentieth century. Has been terribly damaging. The same sense in which Sarsky's influence has been terribly damaging for the enterprise of understanding phenomena in the 20th century. So, what I mean is that uh, uh, I don't, I mean, I share with one some uh, pragmatic intuition. Then you put yourself there. Right? Well, okay. yes. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, I share with one uh, uh, some pragmatic intuition, but I don't share some other. But the basic idea, for example, the idea that uh, uh, classical, I don't know, predicate calculus is the language of science and of sense and of this kind of thing, or that to be, to be the, the value of a variable or this kind of thing. I don't think so. Uh, Quine is a reductionist, and I'm not. Mm -hmm. okay. No, it's okay. We can discuss that uh, afterwards. So, um, but okay, his his pragmatism. I I'm, I I shouldn't put Quine in the center here and, and defend him. He but uh, I think another uh, another feature of Quine's pragmatism that seems to 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 bring you close to him is that he thinks language is evolving even if if you think that he's a, a reductionist or something like that for him logical is historical and logical uh, has a it's dependent of a linguistic evolution so um uh, what I wanted to say is that um, in your point of view, it seems to be important that uh, truth is part of our engagement in communication. But it, at the same time, that is also weak. That's not very strong. And maybe um, why? Because um, I, I couldn't yet understand how speech acts and context of speech acts would make a difference in our in the meaning of truth. Maybe uh, because it seems from your point of view that um, it seems from your point of view, when you ask how to establish a complete theory of truth, uh, that what is important is to know the meaning of truth and afterwards to think about the multiple speech acts that we can perform using this, this kind of concept. Isn't that right? No. no. Okay. Because... Uh, I mean, I, I think of myself as a feminist pragmatist. So I don't think that there, is, uh, that there are two, two different enterprise, enterprises here. First, understanding the meaning of truth, and then seeing uh, what is the, the contribution of the notion to the different speech chats in which it appears. For me, this is knowing the meaning of truth. There is nothing previous. 
knowing the meaning of truth is understanding how it works in the different speech acts. And if we want to, to, to draw or to abstract a theory of the meaning of truth, about the, the meaning of truth, this is just, as I said, an abstraction. So, because, so be, because we have detected, but I, I, I usually uh, uh, classify my position in philosophy of language and uh, in philosophy of logic uh, as synthetic or empirical. So all these theses that I have listed at the beginning of my talk are, in my view, empirical, which means they are proposals of how we use the term. So it's an empirical hypothesis that we speakers use truth terms to build up a propositional variable in order to be able to endorse content put forward in different assertive kind of uh, different assertive speech acts. This is my position, but I don't think I mean I, I don't understand what would it mean to say that there is something like the meaning of truth, and then we look at the way in which uh, Agent use the term. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think uh, I don't. Um, I I already uh, spoke about about some of what I wrote. I I found it very interesting uh, the use used of the für Wort für Wort. Uh, in, uh, in German, it's very clear. It's translated by pro pro word, pro word, huh? or uh, here I didn't translate it right. But uh, so it was from Bolzano. Brentano. So at the end, what I mean is that at the end of the 19th century, people in in Eastern Europe used. Uh, began to use the, the, the word fiasar, fiasete. Ah, yes. With this yes. same yes. Yeah. meaning. <coughs> with this same meaning. Frege didn't use it, but Vampy used it. Vampy used it in English. <coughs> yes, um, okay. So it is interesting to have it in German, written in German, because it's stronger, I think, uh, for us to hear the für than the pro. It seems uh, more enlightening than to hear the pro, because pro isn't a preposition, and für is a preposition in German. So. And I think it's translated very well your your approach in the sense that you mean what you mean by true is tr what you mean uh, what you think true means for us is that we use the predicate is true to um, to emphasize a content a propositional content so we give a uh, we we. Uh, we give a word for it in the sense that we we speak uh, in in pro of it in pro of it. So I, I found the the origin of your of of this pro know. sentence or pro word very interesting to, so as to understand yes, your I approach. Don't know if, uh, I don't know whether whether Ramsey this use of the word fiasar. I, I, I don't know if uh, they are two different, uh, two independent traditions. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting. This idea was, let's say, was in the end. The okay. End. I, so, I, I. We don't, we haven't heard what it is. Oh, what I mean? I think we should. Uh, 
Uh, we we should return or faculty should return to it after that. Yeah, yeah, or maybe no? we should let you finish with your comments and then we can reply because it's like a forum. No, no, uh, I, um, I, no, I, I am just referring to the few of us, or few of us, uh, because um, as I, I read it in Maria's uh, book, um, uh, for Maria, it's very important as. She wrote here this this kind this movement here. So this reference this is I think the uh, the most important so as to understand what she means by high order concept. So when you have this structure where you say this is true. <laughs> uh, what is do, the this structure re, uh, permits to refer to a proposition? So this reference is a pure reference in the sense that I I give my word or I I am proud of it. I am uh, in favor. That would be I think the, the best. Uh, interpretation. I mean, I am in favor of this content. I agree. I agree with this content here. So in, in German, fear is, uh, I agree with that. And, um, and this was very clarifying when I read, uh, as a German speaker, when I read fear words, Oh, that's it. <laughs> and afterwards, uh, Maria also, uh, uh, we discussed a little bit about that, and it was, uh, I, I got the idea that was, I think that's very central for your understanding of truth. That, so, uh, when you say a sentence, a proposition or a sentence that, that, Includes the predicate. It's true. What you are doing is you are referring to a content with with which you agree. And uh, that I think is is central. I, I that would be. I think uh, I would like. Uh, Today, tomorrow, and after to to uh, discuss more about this uh, link you do between logic and and pragmatism. I'm not sure how it is done. <laughs> okay, but uh, let us uh, now we have a, a break for a coffee outside, and we will return uh, at. Now it is oh, not four right 20. now? Huh? 40? 20 to 40. Okay, then we return at four o'clock uh, to the continuation of, of Maria's presentation. Okay, well, he, she will speak about the distinction of syntactic, semantic, and pragmatics, and maybe destroy it. I don't know. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. We come back. Maria. Se todos saírem, nós fechamos a sala. Tá bom, obrigada.